Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, or good afternoon, as the case may be. Hey, this is Mr. Abel, in case you couldn't figure that out. I don't know what you're doing uh, to make social distancing a thing for you, but this seems to work for me. You can't imagine the looks that I get when I go to Target for essential items only. Hey, um, today we're going to talk about the new DBQ. Hopefully you've gotten information from the College Board about the change in the test and uh, how that's going to be a little bit different. Well, uh, this morning, or this afternoon, as the case may be, we are going to go through step by step not only the changes, but we're going to use an example from the Enlightenment uh, to kind of highlight what those changes are moving forward. So you'll do well on the exam uh, coming up in about a month or so. Um, so by the way, I'm using this for both AP World and AP European since uh, it's uh, an example that both of you guys might see uh, on the test or at least consistent with the material we've covered. Uh, so I know it's a little out of sync for both of you, but hang on. Let's do it together. Are you ready? Let's go. Okay, everybody, and I do mean everybody because this is AP World, this is AP European, and like I said, I apologize <clears throat> that this isn't individualized for your class, but this is a, a potential topic that all of you guys uh, could face. So here we go. This is the revised 2020 DBQ, and hopefully you know by now. And if you have not received uh, information from the College Board, uh, you need to uh, make sure you contact uh, the College Board and get on their mailing list. Uh, this should be through my AP Classroom. That's what you guys did back in the fall when you registered. So that's how you should be getting your information at this point. Uh, so uh, if you uh, pay attention to the question of the day, you know that the format of the DBQ has changed. There's going to be one question on the AP exam. It's going to be a DBQ, but it's a revised format. Instead of you having seven questions, or excuse me, seven documents, you're going to have five. One question, uh, five documents, and it's going to be a DBQ. Uh, so let's get right into it. <clears throat> so this is a DBQ on the Enlightenment. And what I have here for you, this is just for us, uh, you know, quote unquote, in-house uh, teaching content moment. On the AP exam, you likely are not going to get this context and historical setting. Why? Because you are getting a point for you bringing context to the question. This is today just, again, for our uh, learning purposes only. This is putting the Enlightenment uh, in a historical context and a historical setting. Um, and this is us using this to review for the topic. So the idea is that the scientific revolution of focus on reason, along with the growing secularist humanist outlook of the Renaissance, led to an intellectual movement called the Enlightenment. I'm going to leave it at that. You can come back and read this for yourself. And I've actually posted the paper copy PDF of this DBQ uh, on Canvas. But this is kind of putting it in historical context and setting again. This is what was going on at the time or just before uh, the time of the Enlightenment. So like I say there at the bottom, you're not going to get this kind of information on uh, the AP exam coming up. So Here's the question that we're looking at. To what extent were the ideas of the Enlightenment philosophes revolutionary? And that's not a misprint. Philosophes was a name for, and we'll see down here in just a second, was a name for the thinkers of the period of the Enlightenment. And here's a bonus question. Where did they do their thinking? What was the place where they did it? One, two, three, four. Okay, how many of you said salons? Did you say that? Okay, fantastic. There you go. You're good. Okay. So the first thing we want to do with any DBQ is what is the question asking? Now, key phrase, to what extent? Now, why is to what extent a key phrase? So this is telling you that the documents already include information that indicates that they were, in fact, revolutionary. That's not for us to decide. What is for us to decide is just how revolutionary were they? To what extent were they revolutionary? Now, key word, philosophes. Now, why is that a key word? This gives us a clue for what kind of revolutionary ideas will be talked about. What is it that the philosophes talked about? Well, knowing that helps us formulate our arguments and categories, which we'll talk about in detail coming up in just a second. But the philosophes were the intellectuals of the 18th century Enlightenment. 
They were public intellectuals who applied reason to the study of many areas of learning, including philosophy, history, science, but important for our essay right now is politics, economics, and social issues. They've almost just given us our categories by understanding who the philo philosophers were, but enough on that now. We'll get back to that in a second. But as important is what kind of question is it? Is it a causation question? Is it a compare and contrast question? Or is it a change in continuity over time question? So, again, what kind of question is it? Key phrase, again, to what extent? Now, why is this a key phrase in this context? The question is telling us that the ideas of the Enlightenment were revolutionary, and they is doing that by ask, asking us to what extent were they revolutionary? Okay, so we know they're revolutionary, but compared to what? This is the key understanding of formatting the entire essay. Revolutionary compared to what? There it is. It's a compare and contrast question. That dictates how we configure our thesis statement. This means we are comparing Enlightenment philo philosophes' ideas to something. We don't know exactly what yet, but we're going to get there. So, note. Normally, I would advise you to move right into the forming of your argument and categories right now, but because there's some rich clues here that give us an idea about context and outside information, I want to explore that first, and then we'll jump into forming your arguments. So, context and outside information clue. Okay, it's a compare and contrast question. Compared to what? The philosophes' ideas were revolutionary compared to to what. Now once we identify what, we're going to have an idea about our context and outside information. So let's jump on that one. Context and outside information clue. Compare and contrast. Compared to what. The philosophic ideas were revolutionary compared to what. That what helps us understand the context and may again give us clue to our outside information. So quick reminder, while both context and outside information are technically outside information, that is to say this is information that you are bringing to the essay separate from what is in the documents, you can't double dip. In other words, you can't get points for context and uh, outside information. You have to have uh, separate context and separate uh, outside information. And so because of the reformat, you are supposed to have two pieces of outside information. So that means you're going to have context, that's one, and uh, two pieces of outside information. So technically that's three pieces of outside information you're bringing to the essay. So context. You already were given a context for this essay, but let's step back and think in terms of from to. So historically speaking, we're always moving from something to something. Whatever it is that we're talking about now is either a response to or different from what we were talking about before. So the Enlightenment is a turning point in history because we're going from one way of political, economic, and social orientation to another. So the from part can help us formulate context and outside information. So that's saying what came before the Enlightenment. We're coming from what to the Enlightenment, right? So here we go. From. This is the from part. This is what we're comparing the philosophes' ideas to. The philosophes' ideas were revolutionary compared to what came before them, which were ideas such as the great chain of being. Now, we're just kind of spitballing stuff here. The great chain of being, absolutism, and, so and societies where individuals, uh, freedom, individual freedom did not exist. Okay? So you can see your favorite picture up there of the great chain of being and our uh, most ever sexy and humble uh, Louis XIV. Wow, look at that hair. Uh, so anyway, uh, this helps us formulate our context. The philosophes' ideas must be understood in the context of what came before them. And what came before them were this idea of the great chain of being, which was a medieval worldview based on hierarchical structure of all matter and life uh, and thought in medieval Christianity and Christianity were to have come from God. Okay, that was then medieval thought. Enlightenment is different than that. And then uh, absolutism, as embodied by Louis XIV, that was a way of societal organization encompassing politics, religion, a society that was different and came before the Enlightenment. So the Enlightenment is compared to both of those ideas. 
Okay, so from, again, this is the from part, so this helps us have some formative ideas about outside evidence that we might want to bring in. Obviously, we've not yet seen the documents, right? So we don't know what is in the documents. Presumably, though, the documents will be about what the Phyllis, uh, about the philosophes, and I'm telling you, they are about that. So we're, again, we're just kind of spitballing ideas, but uh, therefore, here are some ideas for outside evidence before we even see the documents. And again, we'll see the, the entire list of the documents momentarily. But here are some ideas that you might bring in to support your argument. The great chain of being, medieval worldview, absolutism, divine right. Those are all ideas that don't necessarily appear um, in the documents that you could bring in as outside, uh, outside evidence to support your argument. Okay, now let's go back to arguments and categories, right? So before you dive in to the documents, before you do your document analysis, you want to have an idea <clears throat> of what you're looking for, right? You don't want to just go in there. You don't want to go into the forest, uh, you know, in, in not knowing uh, what you're looking for. So let's, let's look at these two guiding questions. How were the philosophes' ideas revolutionary? What were the philosophes' ideas that were revolutionary? Those are two questions that kind of help us get started. So let's circle back to who were the philosophes. The philosophes were the intellectuals of the 18th century Enlightenment. They were public intellectuals who applied reason to the study of many areas, including philosophy, history, science, politics, economics, and social issues. Now, hopefully this is starting to sound familiar because we've done a lot of work in our DBQ work this year about creating categories. OK, what kind of thing, what kind of argument are I looking for in the documents? A political one, an economic one, a social one. So these are just formative ideas that we're setting up that we might be looking for in the documents. Of course, you're probably going to find them. You may not. You have to be prepared for that. You have to be prepared for the fact that the documents might give you information that you haven't thought about yet. But at least we have an idea of what we're looking for. The ideas of the philosophes that were revolutionary, revolutionary, we're looking primarily for political, economic, or social issues, right? Okay. So these are our arguments, politics, econ economics, and social issues. That is to say... Uh, what were the political, economic, and again, social uh, ideas of the philosophes that were revolutionary compared to what came before them? So as we begin to analyze the documents, we're looking for those categories as the basis for our arguments. Okay, let's move on. So this is uh, document one. This is really the only one we're going to work with. Again, you had the entire packet, um, but I want to uh, just use this, was, this one as an example. So as we look at that, there's, I don't even have to read the whole thing, honestly. Um, and this is, this is something that hopefully you're getting pretty good at too. Um, hopefully you see words, phrases, or key ideas that let you know uh, how you should be evaluating. What information on this document is important uh, that gives you a clue for how you're going to use it to further your argument. So uh, wh while I'm sitting here droning on, I'm guessing several of you have figured out or honed in on a couple of things. Let's look at the very first thing. The very first one that jumped out at me is this, right? And th there in blue, Mary Wollstonecraft, Vindication of the Rights of Women. Okay, what's the point of view there? Okay, it's Mary Wollstonecraft. She is a woman, right? Uh, when Let's keep going. Oh, consider I address you as a legislator. Okay, that's suggesting that there's some political content. But again, I want to go to back to Mary Wollstonecraft. She is a woman writing in 1792. So not only is it a political piece, but it's probably saying something about society as well. Okay, what else jumps out at us? Ooh, new constitution. So again, political. So as I am doing uh, my note taking for uh, the, as I'm doing my analysis note taking, here's what my notes look like. So what is the category? So I put this in the social and political, and I've intentionally put social first because it's both, even though it's both, Wollstonecraft was a woman, and in 1792, uh, she was a woman advocating for women's rights, right? And that's more of a social change necessarily than it is a political change. 
it is both, but you'll see in a moment how I'm using that to uh, uh, support my argument for social change more so than political change. So what is the point of view? Again, this is Mary Wollstonecraft from her work, Vindication of the Rights of Women, done in 1792. So the point of view was that in asterisks, and you'll see why in a moment, women should be included in society just like men. Okay, so who was she writing this to? She was writing it to men. What was her purpose? Her purpose was to persuade men that had political power to conclude, include women in all phases of society, political, social, economic life of society. So 1792, why is that important? This is a huge clue. What was going on in 1792? In 1792, this is in the midst of the French Revolution, and again, this is huge. Uh, to include women in anything was a radical change. You will also use this point as the analysis to your analysis uh, when we get to uh, the doc using the document to support our argument in a moment, okay? So this is how we're going to get our extra point uh, for analysis when we get there, okay? Okay, so now our favorite, thesis plus context. How many things does a good thesis do? A good thesis does three things. It addresses all parts of the question, creates a historically defendable argument, organizes the essay, and for our purposes for AP uh, history, and, and a bonus, it includes your introduction to context. So for this thesis, we, know it's, uh, we now know it's a compare and contrast, so it will do everything above, but we need to make sure that when we construct our thesis that we're writing it not only to include those three things plus context, that we're also formatting it uh, to be a compare and contrast thesis. Okay, so let's take a look at a sample thesis statement here. Understanding the Enlightenment philosophers' ideas as being revolutionary compared to the more medieval worldview that preceded them must be understood in the context of the change from a God-centered world fueled by hierarchy and tradition to a more modern worldview based on in individual rights and humanism. The social and political theories written about by the likes of Mary Wollstonecraft, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and Montesquieu were definitely a revolutionary departure compared to the social and political views of the medieval period. Okay, let's see what we have here. Okay, so we first, we've compared, right? So we've set it up to say that we're comparing the medieval worldview to that of uh, the Enlightenment philosophers. So in other words, we're saying what came before or the from is medieval worldview. We're going to uh, and comparing to the uh, Enlightenment philosophers. What else do we have here? Okay, we've introduced context there in the yellow. Must be understood in the context of the change from a God-centered world fueled by hierarchy and tradition. So this is this is the context that the Enlightenment has, right? This is the context the Enlightenment occurs in. We're going from this way of seeing the world that used to be in the medieval world to a more modern worldview, and that's the context that the Enlightenment as a whole must be understood in. Okay, what else do we have here? Okay, we have our first argument, revolutionary departure social, right? So... Uh, you'll see here in just a minute, our second one is political, right? So you could have done these together. You could have had one paragraph, one argument, and said social and political, but I think for our purposes, we want two uh, separate paragraphs. It'll keep it cleaner and neater to have one being social and one being political. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so now paragraph one is thesis plus justification. Now, this is a change. This is new. Make note. Stamp this on your forehead. Highlight it, underline it, asterisk. Normally in our old formula, I had you introduce outside information in paragraph two. Uh, since you were only likely going to have two body paragraphs, we're going to include outside evidence in both body paragraphs. Again, this is new and different. You wouldn't have done this until the second paragraph, but because uh, you have to do this twice, we're going to do it in both paragraphs. So for the sake of this example, we're going to use document one only. That's the only document I'm going to use, the Wallstonecraft document, as our example to get started. I'm going to demonstrate how to use it to get your analysis point for appropriately citing a document, and then how to get that extra gravy point, the analysis of your analysis point. And that's what will be underlined. So when you introduce it and parenthetically cite it, doc one, 
right? That's when you're actually getting the point for appropriately citing the document. And where you, where you see it underlined, that's where you're getting your second point for appropriately analyzing your own analysis, okay? So also, again, we'll be including context, context justification and outside evidence. So this is going to be a jam-packed, busy paragraph, but let's try it. Okay, so here we go. That the Enlightenment philosophers' ideas were revolutionary is almost a historical given. The extent to which they were revolutionary is amplified if one considers the context of the worldview against which they are compared. You see what we did there? We're introducing context, but we're also making note that we're going to be comparing. Beginning during the period of the Renaissance, the idea of individualism and humanism emerged to challenge an old worldview rooted in hierarchical uh, in a hierarchical uh, religious, shouldn't say by their political and social system, with God as the sole and ultimate authority. So you see what we've done there? Here is what we're comparing. We've made the comparison as our context. It's just easy that way, right? So we're saying that what came before uh, this uh, medieval worldview is what we're comparing to what the philosophes were saying. Now, the philosophes' revolutionary ideas touched on all phases of the human condition, but perhaps the two most dominant themes were social and political change. While Mary Wollstonecraft's work in vindication of the rights of women is clearly both political and social in nature, what makes it truly revolutionary is its social impact compared to the more traditional worldview held regarding women, uh, held regard women prior to the Enlightenment. So there's argument one. As we're make, that's where we're making our first argument, uh, and that matches up with our first argument in the thesis. They're both blue. Remember that? So here I am using, where I say in document one, what you do not want to do is simply quote from the document. Please do not do that. Right? They want to see you uh, synthesize what was in the document and say it in your own words. So in document one, yes, Wollstonecraft is arguing a political point. Remember when we started looking, what jumped out us? New constitution. She's talking to the legislature. Okay, yes, it's in a political context, but uh, let's keep it uh, to the point of we're using this as a social social argument, though. But she is arguing a completely different social point than any other of her male counterparts. She is suggesting that women just not simply be included in the new constitution. She takes it one step further by making her point unique for a woman and a woman of her time. See why that's underlined? That is you anal analyzing your analysis. So right above that, where it says in document one, yes, Wollstonecraft is arguing a political point, especially when addressing the new constitution, doc one. You've just alerted the reader that you're using document one, and you've just summarized the entirety of document one in a sentence, right? So you get your point for appropriately using and citing the document. But to get that second point and to demonstrate to the reader you understand what the document actually said and what is unique about it relative to, to, relative to your argument, that's where the underlying part comes in. Now we're going to we're going to expand on that in just a second as we bring in outside information. So this is the first part of our paragraph. Here's the second part continued. One must consider the importance of the time frame and audience for her work. Let's stop right there. You just told the reader that you understand point of view, right? One must important the, the time frame 792 1792 is absolutely critical and who the audience was. It's men, right? So you just told the reader that you understood when it was written and who it was written for is important and impacts the document itself. She is speaking to men at a time when women had no natural rights. Natural rights in quotation marks because who said that? Of course, it was John Locke. You just further demonstrated that you understand the impact of the document. Okay, here is new outside information. Furthermore, and crucial to understanding the time period, she wrote this document in 1792 during the midst of the French Revolution. In 1789, the seminal document of the French Revolution emerged, the Declaration of the Rights of Man, of, of man and of Citizen. Okay, so everything that's in purple there, that is outside information that does not appear in the documents that you are using to support your argument. OK, 
Okay, do you see where that's happening? So this is information you're bringing in from outside of the documents to support your argument. Further, this document outlined universal and natural rights for, exactly as the title says, men, as would have been consistent with the medieval thought of the place of women in society. Wollstonecraft's edict was not only a revolutionary change to the social and political order of her immediate context of the French Revolution, but an enlightenment principle that would be the foundation for the rights of women universally moving forward. So I have that underlined as well because that's all you referring back to the document and you and analyzing the real and true importance and meaning of the document. Therefore, you've shown the reader uh, that you understand the document uh, in, its, uh, in its own right, but you also understand how it impacts the argument directly. So that's it. And so what I would like for you to do at this point is just go through the rest of the documents, make sure you uh, read through those documents and understand how you would use them in the same context that we've used uh, this document to support your arguments. Hey, if you've got any questions, you let me know. Have a great day.